So I want to talk about potholes. <laughs> Probably the least sexy topic ever to start off any kind of TEDx talk, potholes. And this is something that we've all experienced. You're driving down any major interstate, you're driving around a road in Madison, and you hit a pothole. And you probably continue to hit that pothole for not you know, one or two weeks, but usually a bad pothole, you might hit that every single year, year in, year out. And potholes have existed pretty much as long as there's been paved roads. And if you think about it, when it, the first road in Madison was around the 1870s, the first pothole probably had turned up around like 1871. <laughs> but really, the way potholes have been addressed, it's the same exact way. The technology may have slightly changed, but in 1871, the only difference was a horse and buggy goes out with asphalt, dumps it in the pothole, you fill up the pothole. Now, it's maybe a hybrid truck driving to the pothole, fill, take out the asphalt, filling in the pot. Nothing's really changed in the cycle. But what really has changed is how we communicate about that pothole. You know, in the 1880s, you'd send a telegram or a telegraph to your elected leader to say there's a pothole, and they would, you know, wait, talk about it, to, you know, talk about it for, you know, many years and then fill it. In the 1920s, you could write a letter to the editor, you could call up on the phone, you could talk to someone if you could afford a phone, complain about it, send emails in 2000, you could start to blog about it, in, write on Facebook or social media, tweet about it, but really at the end of the day, the same pothole continues to exist. Now you can actually take a picture of that pothole with the exact geographic, you know, the geo latitude for it and send that directly to a politician so they know exactly where the pothole is. It still doesn't mean that pothole gets fixed. So why does this matter to me? Well, partly, uh, I started a tech company about five years ago, and really now what we're doing is building iPhone and, Andro and, and Android applications. I'm involved in the entrepreneurship community, and I'm really trying to push that bar for what innovation is. And on the, my nights, I'm also on the city council. And I was elected as one of the youngest elected leaders in anywhere across the United States. And the demand of my constituents is to be engaged, to be involved, you know, communicate not by a weekly newsletter, but by Facebook posts, by sending out tweets, by communicating over social media. So I'm trying to push that bar much higher. So I'm going to go over a couple of examples of what other cities are doing with technology, just saying, that's really cool, we should see this in Madison. So one thing that Boston's doing is Boston figured out that now we have accelerometers in our phones and everybody is driving around with a phone in their hand. And if they bounce in that phone, it's going to create a shock wave and that shock wave is going to be read by your phone and device. Well, what happens if all the police officers, all the garbage trucks, all the utility vehicles that are driving around the city sent a message to where their phone bumped the hardest? So it, the city of Boston is doing is have all of their employees basically what's called street bump. And what street bump does is measures the bumps in the road. And what they can do is better track where are their potholes and also where are the most severe potholes because it's those city workers who are driving over it and actually recalculate the list of what are the priorities. Also in Boston, so here in Madison you can send a picture of, that, of, of the pothole but Boston's also improving it, taking it one step further. So what they're doing is once that pothole is actually fixed, you get a picture of the actual city worker who actually fi <laughs> physically fixed that pothole. But it's a new way that the go what government can actually interact with constituents. Uh, another piece, and this is all over the country, this phenomenon is going on. You know, this is uh, San Francisco. And what San Francisco ended up doing was they started putting sensors on every single parking meter that they have. So they can tell you right now what is the availability of parking throughout the entire city. And what that does is it not only makes it so you can check on your phone where a parking spot is, but it takes traffic off the road. It actually means people are less likely to drive around a loop around the Capitol Square, and they could actually just find the parking spot easier. But when you think about it, what the cost savings are, both in gasoline for the consumer, but for the wear and tear of that road, there are huge benefits, both for the environment, but for everyday life that you're living in a city. The police department's getting involved in this. And if you were to think about wanted posters sitting in the post office, you know, back in the Old West, you would see the wanted poster, you'd say, I know that guy, because we are always going to the post office to mail letters. Uh, 
we're not mailing letters the same way we used to. So what can we take the next steps on actually finding out who's wanted in the community? And the answer is Pinterest. <laughs> and by posting your most wanted individuals, this is the new area. And, and actually, if you look at social demographics and who you're trying to get these you know, pictures in front of, you know, particularly the demographics that hit Pinterest are perfect for identifying criminals. <laughs> We hear this concept of big data, and, and I mean, there's a whole movement to talk about that, all right, well, big data is going to be the next big thing, and no one's going to know how to use it, and this is a waste of money. Well, we're starting to use big data in different ways to actually predict where crime is going to occur. And something that I can promise you, if there is a gunshot outside, everybody, not everybody in this room, but most of you will hit Facebook or Twitter to say, I heard a gunshot. Well, what the city of Chicago Police Department is learning is they can actually learn information from that, not only to be able to track down potential witnesses, but also to be able to start to isolate crime and crime information. So if they see and they hear over social media that there's always the calm before the storm, we can integrate these kind of ideas to actually make our cities safer and have police officers on site even before it happens uh, as well as locate and try to actually bring criminals to justice. A another company, Lifeline Line Response, is trying to take an approach on sexual assaults. And traditionally, you'd be either see the blue light on college campuses or walking through. Uh, there's a point of carrying your cell phone, don't carry your cell phone. Well, what this company has done is actually said, well, if you just have your cell phone in your hand and are always pressing down on it, and for whatever reason you release your finger on it, this will not only send out an alert and a very high-pitched sound, but also have the ability to send a text message to the police department. So it actually knows whether you've actually gotten from point A to point B, and if there is an issue, be able to send out your geographic location. This one's a really cool one. And this was actually an idea that didn't come from uh, someone who's from a technology background, however, a fire chief. And the fire chief is sitting at lunch, and he's with a series of paramedics, and they hear a siren go off. And right in the restaurant, right next door, someone has had a heart attack. They needed someone to have CPR training, which the fire chief has, and the paramedics that he was with could have easily responded to. But he didn't know that there was someone in cardiac arrest right next door. So what he ended up coming up with was an application that basically would allow citizens to register if they know how to use an AED machine or a CPR. And if there's a medical emergency, if there's a medical emergency right outside of this building at ICON, someone in this room can probably respond back faster than a fire, the, the fire rescue. These are new types of technologies that really were not available even five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but changing the way that cities actually operate. So what are some of the cool things that we're doing here in Madison? So this is, an, this is a website called Ideascale. And what, this is a website that was, pushed, you know, it was created to basically get community input in our budget. Now, we have well over a $200 million budget that we're going through every single year. And you find out the people that respond and actually decide how your taxpayer dollars are being used are the same people every single meeting. Uh, it's the same 50 people. They have the same list. They've been showing up for year after year. It's many, you know, some of them are lobbyists, some of them are community activists. But I will tell you, outside of one or two people in this room, most of you have not been to a community budget hearing to decide how your taxpayer dollars are being used. Well, this is an idea called Idea Scale, and you can go there right now. And we're actually taking submissions and seeing it allows you to vote on what ideas you like. So as we talk about Sector 67, bringing Google Fiber to Madison, uh, opening up different buildings, it allows feedback for you to go online from your own home and vote. We can use this information not only to solicit for new ideas, but we can take this and actually make budgetary decisions based on your input. And the exciting part of this versus the 50 people that would us usually show up to a meeting like this, we've had 1,300 residents now on this site. And even if you assume 70% of them were, not, you know, were from Madison, that means half a percent of our population is now participated in our budget, which is woefully more than any other time before. You know, the other piece to it 
is improving our metro bus system. So this is an app called Bus Radar that you can actually find out where the nearest bus is and down to the minute when is that bus going to be right in front of State Street. It actually takes the most inconvenient part of riding the bus, which is actually waiting for the bus, out of the equation. You could be doing something totally unrelated for the next five minutes and know that you're not going to miss that bus. And this is really cool if you have a smartphone or an Android. These are free, free applications. But this is a monitor that someone else also created. And this is a monitor that can be sitting at any coffee shop, created from a recycled computer, and basically show anybody in that coffee shop when the next bus is. So even if you don't have a smartphone, now you can have that same information as someone who does. The other piece of this is it can also send a text message to you. So one of the things that we've discovered is not everybody has a full data plan. And while there's a great penetration of smartphones, text messaging services still have a much higher penetration across all socioeconomic statuses. So you can actually text message now to find out where your bus is for free. As Mapolis here in town is using a really cool technology, and what they came up with is the idea of what happens if you take a GPS tracker and just throw it on top of your asthma inhaler. You can actually track where you're having an asthma attack. This is a technology that's all being produced here in Madison. They have a pilot, a pilot study out in Louisville, and what they're discovering is that asthma attacks aren't happening where you would expect asthma attacks to happen. And there's other environmental impacts that you can see time and time again. But we wouldn't know this unless we actually had the data sets. So we start to think about what's next. Where is this technology going in the future? And some of the ideas that we're coming up with is we would love to see lines eliminated in Madison. Uh, whether it's paying for a parking ticket, whether it's getting a permit to do construction on your house, we want lines eliminated. So what happens if we ran a contest? $10,000 to whoever can come up with how to eliminate lines. Now, for that idea, all of a sudden, all taxpayers benefit from this. It's a new idea, it's a new technology, and it's technology in action. But these ideas aren't going to come from people in the seat of bureaucracy. Their job is to perform the services. It takes the entire community to come up with ideas. These are, this is Google Glass, and I got to play around with it for the first time. It's augmented reality, so you can see exactly the buildings that are around you. What happens if you could point it to a building and see the actual underlying zoning code of that building? No one actually really cares about zoning codes. Um, <laughs> that's the truth of it. But figuring out who the, what, you see a problem there and knowing instantly how to submit to that problem. And that when you point the glasses to the building, not only you can take a, take a picture of that, send it to a city official, but also find out who do you make a phone call to? What happens if it's an urgent emergency? All from literally the headgear that you're wearing. Uh, we want to look at predictive measures to try to save neighborhoods. We know that there are certain factors. At this point, we have the information that we know when there's an increase in graffiti that's out of the ordinary, when we know there's other basic crimes of home break-ins. We know that two to three years down the line, if we don't step in, that community will be a distressed neighborhood within two to three years. Take that data and actually try to address these problems before they're actual serious problems. But as we look at Madison itself, the civic innovation is going to come from more people being involved in the decision. And it's not necessarily when that person who's driving around in an SUV or an Alexis has an onboard computer that they can figure out where the parking spot is, but it's when that person who's trying to ride the bus and can see the kiosk and now have access to that same piece of technology. It's trying to break down what's called the digital divide and making sure that these technological solutions are in the hands of every single one of our citizens, that every single citizen in Madison can benefit from these same pieces of technology. It's making sure that children at the youngest ages always have internet access, not necessarily from the library, but inside their house. Because if they're competing at that same exact level and we want all of our school-age children to compete, we need internet. We need to make sure that they have access to computers. We need to make sure that no matter how old you are, you can start to use technology. Trying to introduce these new ideas that are really revolutionary into community centers, into retirement homes, and making sure that everybody is benefiting from it. Because it's as we can have everybody's voice be heard in this community, we're actually going to be in a better place. For the first time, you've been able to actually go 
from not being able to show up to a city meeting but still be able to participate. And when you bring it all back to potholes and thinking about how do you actually solve potholes, in the 1800s, there was maybe 2% of the community that could actually address a pothole issue. Hopefully, as Madison moves forward, everybody can do it. Everybody can do it from the comfort of their own home and really easy technology to solve that. Thank you.